we need to talk about the Kennedy siblings. Episode 1. Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. So these family meeting episodes are a change up from season one, but we wanted to have two different types of episodes starting in season two and going forward because we have so much to say, so much to talk about, and we want to be able to communicate with you guys more openly, a little bit more casually, but we didn't want to inundate like the main story with all of our side tangents and opinions. So these family meeting episodes are going to be sort of a town hall debriefing casual conversation with Bethany and I over the things that come up in each main episode. So these Kennedy family meetings or KFMs will also be where we talk about the speculation surrounding certain events and also conspiracy theories because obviously a lot goes down within the Kennedy family and the Kennedy curse. So there's a lot of folklore and a lot of rumors that are not proven but may be true or have some substance to them or are just interesting to talk about. This is where we get to get into our true crime side tangents or talk about what we suspect may happen. We also mention so many huge, very well-known side characters that don't have a place in our main episodes, a la Gloria Swanson, Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra. The list goes on and on. We can dive into all of it together right here in our bi-weekly Kennedy Family Meetings or KFMs, if you will. Welcome to our first blood and business family meeting. Another huge reason why Cassie and I wanted these family meetings was I can still hear it. Me too. I don't know what to do. It's okay. It's just. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Something that you'll learn about us is, is we have that allergies. we have allergies. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> our voices are a little bit tired because we're coming down with a freaking sinus infection. Yeah. But. We live with sinus infections. We can't so really. What is there to do? Put production on pause. So here you're about we are. To, you're about to hear real aller- allergies come episode two. That was. Oh, really that bad. was. I was like having a full on allergy attack. Yeah. If you saw our Instagram stories, you know that episode two took us three days to get through to film and record. Um, and part of that was because of Bethany's allergies. I was. I started sounding like this like halfway through the episode, and we were just like, "Okay, it needs to be done." Anyways. So another reason why Cassie and I wanted to have these family meetings was because some things just don't hit home until we have fully finished the editing process. We've already recorded the story. And then we're like, wait, that is insane. Maybe, And we did not react to that appropriately. No. And maybe it is when we do that like final pass through listen of like, okay, you're just listening to the story as a listener. Not does there need to be a pause here, a fade out there? Is that breath too loud? (laughs) Yeah. We're just listening to the actual story. And at that moment that things really hit you and you realize that was not okay. <laughs> like What just happened in this story? Because yes. I didn't catch that the first five times I heard it. The main one that me and Bethany still can't get over is from season one in the Bouvier episodes when Jackie freaking Kennedy marries her sister's current and active lover. lover. Lee and Onassis were still dating and they had been dating for like six years or something uh-huh. when... Jackie and him get engaged and then get married. And And don't tell Lee anything until they're already engaged and it's all this weird hush hush. Jackie never freaking told her. Did not talk to her about it. called her. Finally, after she's like, dude, will someone freaking tell me what is going on? Then Onassis didn't speak to her a single word at the freaking ceremony. He like saw her across the way and then walked across the boat to get away. And Jackie was like, I need this. And Lee's like, I know. Oh, like, are you kidding me? Just putting myself in that, in those shoes. I've had a six year relationship with this guy. And not only that, I tried to marry him. My sister told me I couldn't because it would taint. Yeah, I couldn't because it would taint her and her husband. The Kennedy image. That's the only reason that I am not married to him right now. Is because of her. Is because of her. And then she goes off and marries him. What? Anyway. Back to the Kennedy sphere. Well, I mean, that is the Kennedy sphere, but back to these episodes. Another thing that we realized after listening back to the first episode was Joe 
going from a $15,000 a year salary to a $10,000 a year salary. Yeah, Cassie just spouted that off like a fact and I didn't catch it. And then and editing. I, no, I read it, wrote it, performed it. Bethany edited it and showed me the episode and I still didn't like process. <laughs> yeah, like what that actually means. But that's a third of your salary. That's huge for anyone. Yeah. A l- that's a lot. That is a lot of money. And, to, and he to, had a family. He just knew this is not going to, this has a ceiling. I need to go get in another lane. That's a huge lesson in and of itself. And this is something that the Kennedys were so good at is having the end in mind. Like he was going into it knowing where he wanted to end up. So mm-hmm. he was able to recognize that the position he was in was not going to get him where he wanted to be. So he had to change something. And if that was taking a pay cut, that was taking a pay cut. Bethany and I have learned this lesson the hard way, spending years on something and realizing, oh, we're not even going in the direction that we want to (laughs) go. No. And we're working hard. We're working a lot harder than we are smarter. So let's reevaluate here. And that's what Joe Kennedy did really, really well. So then he gained that insider information from the lower paying job. And that is what he used to make his stock market bets and make his millions. Also, because the Kennedy family is so big and has so many different moving parts and so many insane, interesting things happen, we have to cut out certain interesting things that we would maybe add to other stories that maybe had one or two siblings. (laughs) With the Kennedys, things are just flying out of the sky and hitting them and from all angles. Yes, it's just an absolutely detailed story that is so fascinating. And there are so many parts that you want to talk about for like 10 minutes that Mm -hmm. we have to cut out really interesting things. And one of the really interesting things is the fact that JFK's father, I need to start (gasps) the story over. This is insane. So we learned in the first episode that JFK is the second born right after Joe Jr. Cassie said that it wasn't a super eventful birth. Well, what we didn't talk about was that JFK gets sick over and over and over again. And then he gets scarlet fever. And he is close to death. The Catholic Church actually came in and a priest gave him his last rites. Because they literally- Preparing for death. Yeah, they literally thought he was dying. So Joe Sr., JFK's father, thinks that his son is dying. So he goes to church and prays and begs God to save his little boy. And he says, God, if you save my son, I will give you half of everything that I have. 50% of what I own will be yours. And I will donate it to charity if you save my kid. JFK lives. JFK lives. And what does this man do? Gives 50% of his assets to an orphanage. Mm-hmm. 50%, so you guys, to someone who is literally trying to make his first million, he is on a he is on the clock. He is wanting to, to become rich and successful fast. This guy is like counting his pennies ready to hit that million dollar mark and still gives half, not 20%. Not 15%. Which means that he really believed that there was a God and that he had a conversation with him. Because I think most people would have just been like, oh, well, that's crazy. Or like, that was a coincidence. Or I was just being super emotional. I was like in a time of desperation. So it shows, yeah, how religious he was and how much he really did believe in a God. But also how true to his word he was. In episode one, the reason that we start with their lineage is because the Kennedy culture, way of life, mentality really started with their parents and their grandparents. Yeah. Honey Fitz was basically the one who really got the ball rolling in politics and in climbing the social ladder for both families, essentially. Yeah. Blows my mind that like the Kennedys were not the end all be all. Yeah. They were leeching off of the Fitzgerald name. The Kennedys... The Kennedy paternal grandpa was in politics as well, but just much a much lower scale, not quite as known and not as like grandiose ho about yeah. it. Yeah. So Grandpa Fitzgerald is the one who proclaimed that the firstborn grandson was going to be president. And we obviously know <gasps> that the second born becomes president. And he's the one who's named after Honey Fitz, which is so freaking weird that that we happened. Have to talk and it's about like that. manifest. <laughs> like he literally <laughs> manifested that the grandson that was named after him was going to be the president. And that literally happened. Do you know how weird that is? But like he, ha- he would never have been able to orchestrate that. It, it blows my mind. And I don't believe in any weird crap. But Honey Fitz is sitting there. I don't know if he's praying or if he's just planning things and he's just focusing and talking about it with his family, whatever. But he is saying, I want you to name my firstborn grandson, 
John Fitzgerald. And he is going to be the top of his class and he's going to do all this stuff. And then he's going to be president, yada, yada, yada. Well, while Joe Jr. was the top of his class, all American boy. For sure successful. And like they trained him up to be that way and they encouraged him and all of that. And he did have a massive amount of talent, maybe even more talent than Jack did. Somehow, Joe, the dad, was like, no, no, no. My firstborn son is going to be named after me. So Joe Jr. didn't get any of that manifesting power, manifestation, whatever, planning that Honey Fitz did. And then when they did name the second son after Honey Fitz, it's like all of that was attached to the name John and Fitzgerald. became attached to JFK. It freaks me out. There's too many things with the Kennedys that are like that. And even uh, Teddy, the youngest son, he was like, you know what? Maybe there is something to this whole Kennedy curse thing. But- Later on in future episodes, we will get into what happens to Joe Jr. And it is, I can't even say, it's so weird. So, although Cassie and I don't necessarily believe in like voodoo magic and making a pact with the devil, like maybe we do now. (laughs) Because (laughs) Because maybe the Kennedys did are a freaking blip in the ether. Like what even happened there? And it for sure had to be something, like something non-human was going on there. Their story is just, there are just too many coincidences. And I don't know if I believe in coincidence and I don't know if I believe in like, I kind of don't. All coincidences are just divine intervention, whether it's good or bad. That's what I've always said, which is weird. I'm like, oh, I don't believe in coincidences. That's just like not a thing. And so now applying that to this, I'm like, wait, what? what? Then what does that mean? Maybe the devil was just trying to take them out because they were just causing too many good, powerful things to happen. But seriously, if that was happening in the presidential lineage right now, like the whole manifesting things over your grandson, publicly publishing it in the newspaper, saying it, and then 40 years down the road or 30 years down the road, it actually happens, I would be freaked out. Going back to context and everything, if you just think about everything that's happening during the Kennedy lifetime, like the Kennedy siblings story and during their life, A lot of it, a lot of the scary, crazy, weird, bizarre, what the heck, question your belief system. Things happen in the future, obviously. I would say from episode four on, it gets real crazy. Mm -hmm. But think about the civil rights movement, MLK, Malcolm X, and the Black Panthers. Think about the FBI and the CIA and everything that was going on in politics at this time. And then you think about how many people were assassinated that were trying to cause change for society and for America freaks me out. And there's definitely some sort of conspiracy theories that have to be real because there's no way that all of that is just random one-off crazy person like making crap happen. Like that is too, it's too much. This is out of, yeah, like here's a very concrete example of something that a person could not have controlled and could not have orchestrated. There are a weird amount of coincidences going on with JFK versus Abraham Lincoln. So Lincoln and Kennedy each have seven letters in their names, okay? Both presidents were elected to Congress in 46, quote unquote, 1846 for Lincoln, 1946 for Kennedy. Whoa. And both elected president in 60, 1860, and 1960. Already really weird. Both were assassinated. Both assassins, John Wilkes Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald, were born in 39. 1839 and 1939. They were both known by their three names composed of 15 letters, John Wilkes Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald. What the crud it continues, okay? I'm just like seeing threat, like the, these invisible threads. Like what is happening? Both presidents were shot in the head on a Friday. Both Lincoln and Kennedy were succeeded by a vice president named Johnson and born in 08, 1908 and 1808. What? Andrew Johnson took over the presidential office from Abraham Lincoln whenever he was assassinated, 
and Lyndon B. Johnson took over for JFK after he was assassinated. What, like, what, is, like, I have chills. What is this? It's too exact. And numbers, too, freak me out. If you've ever read the Bible, numbers and names are a huge, huge. deal. So, and there can be so many conspiracy theories and so many basically storylines within storylines yes, built if you just off look of at the numbers. numbers. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, listen to this. Both Lincoln and Kennedy, what, what were like headlines of their presidential terms. They were civil rights activists, both mm. emancipation Huge. and freaking segregation. They were also both succeeded by Southerners. Andrew, Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee and Lyndon B. Johnson was from Texas, the two T states. The assassins were both Southerners. Okay. And I looked up how many presidents have been assassinated. So we are on, Biden is the 46th president. Only four have ever been assassinated. Four and two of them were weirdly connected. So it and the freaking plot thickens. Listen to this. Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy who told him not to go to Ford Theater. Kennedy had a secretary named Evelyn Lincoln. Evelyn Lincoln was his personal secretary. He she came into his bedroom and like transposed his speeches and stuff like that as he like talked out loud to her very very close to her Lincoln she warned him not to go to Dallas now I don't know if the whole like them telling them not to go to the Ford Theater or not to go to Dallas is real but for sure it's real that Lincoln's secretary names. was named Kennedy and Kennedy's secretary was named Lincoln that what the is f- and with everything bizarre. else czar okay and I have chills for this too both of the assassins, Oswald and Booth, were taken out and assassinated before they could be put on trial. On April 26, 1865, after refusing to surrender, John Wilkes Booth was assassinated by Sergeant Boston Corbett. And then on November 24th, 1963, on his way to the county jail, Lee Harvey Oswald was assassinated by a nightclub owner, Jack Ruby. And these little snippets are from Wikipedia, but the original um, article that I saw that brought my attention to all these weird coincidences was on PBS. So people are aware of it. Just like, yeah, like you said, things that cannot be planned, that one human could no. not have orchestrated it because A, one human it's a is- a hundred years yeah, apart. Yeah, they don't, they're not a freaking live. But B, is this some sort of like underground club, like the mafia or something that's just like over years and years and years? You know no, I mean? not like the mafia, like or the freaking- FBI. The freaking Illuminati. Illuminati. Oh my gosh. And there is some weird stuff about like, I can't remember what it's called, but there's this retreat that all of these political leaders go on. And it's proven that like, I don't know, like George Washington all the way up to like Biden have gone out to this weird place in California and they do like some freaking weird stuff like maybe satanic rituals and crap. What? I can't remember what it's called, but there's a weird amount of presidents that have like been proven to go to this retreat. Like a self-help retreat? Like what type of retreat is this? All men. Some people say that they like get naked and dance in the woods. Journalists will like hide. Like people have seen them do some like weird. I don't freaking know. I haven't people have seen it. like people have seen Bigfoot. I don't know, but you never know. And that has been the conclusion of our conspiracy of the day. In our main episode, we talked about how the Kennedy ancestors lived in like tenements and the Irish ghetto. And it is so, so, so interesting. And it's crazy how close like generation wise it is to us because it feels like a completely different world. Mm -hmm. A book that I have read and really enjoyed and it it is fiction but it's based on true story i'm gonna totally butcher the author's name but it's bread givers by anzia yazerska highly recommend it's from a young girl's perspective uh but it follows her through her life and basically like how that impacted her as an adult being an immigrant and she lives in the ghetto and i think that she is jewish Jewish. yeah Yeah. so if you want to like envision it and just get that like mental picture that's a really good book to read The reason that Cassie and I talk so much about what's happening in society, in culture, while we're telling these sibling stories, because yes, obviously the emphasis is on the siblings and their relationships and the family drama, but you really do have to have that cultural 
social context because it changes everything. It changes how families operate, what's expected of people. And it tells us a little bit more of like why certain siblings did what they did. It's even more important for the Kennedy episode specifically because they were so involved in politics and current events and what was happening in America and around the world. So I think it influences the lens that the people that we're talking about lived their lives and made decisions based on, but it can also help us understand like maybe why they did some questionable things or things that didn't make, doesn't make sense to us in our current time, but made sense to them back then. I think there's so much to learn from that perspective and just how much things changed so quickly. Just decade to decade is a a really big difference. And it helps us to know, okay, if things were that different 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago versus 70 years ago, look how far we've come and look how far we can still go then. Mm -hmm. It's, It's almost kind of like an encouragement of, you know, things- Like being progressive. Yeah. Yeah, like things are- very systematic, very set in stone, but look how much they can also change just by a few people Mm -hmm. or just by a movement. Yeah. Like people learning how to think of things differently, which also helps you to kind of even just within your own family or whatever, because uh, the reason we want to do this podcast is just to kind of to learn from other people's stories and where they came from and where they went, but also to Apply it to, yeah, like Cassie's saying, to your own life and your own family and just be able to understand people better. We talked about it in the Ringling Brothers episode, how many people just in a 50-year span came to the U.S. It's that same time period where the Kennedy ancestors came and the circus was like the biggest deal ever. It's our oldest story as well. So it's kind of fun to go back even further because it's- It feels like the, a time portal. Yeah. It's a, it's in the time right before the Disney story and right before the Kennedy story as well. Mm-hmm. But it- feels like a completely different world because America was still so, so young that it was a little bit still like the Wild West. Even just a couple West. decades matter a lot. Yeah, like trains, trains didn't even exist. So that yeah. compared to JFK being the first president on TV, completely different. In the Kennedys episode one, we talked about how Rose and Joe really didn't teach JFK and the Kennedy siblings much about where they came from, much of their Irish heritage or culture. And that is very parallel to our life as well. Our grandparents are immigrants. They immigrated from Colombia, from South America. And while raising my mom, and then when my mom was raising us, my grandpa did not want her speaking Spanish outside of the home and did not want her teaching us Spanish because he didn't want us to have an accent and sort of have that scarlet letter of, oh, they are foreign. Right. It's not about you not loving your original country. You love your culture. You love your people. But especially back in the day, there was a fear-based like caution around there was not prejudice from America. Right. Yeah. Another question that I wanted to kind of pose to everyone, um, because we want to have a conversation. We want these things to be like a back and forth. And something that I want to know from you guys is, is the American dream still alive? This whole Joe just deciding he's going to go out and, and conquer and make millions and become powerful and change his whole legacy Do you think that that is still possible today? Do you think that you can be born into nothing or into like the middle class and then break your way into the most elite influential circle in the world? I go back and forth because there's the internet now. So like who you are and your reputation, I feel like follows you more. And we talk about that in the Ringling episodes. Yes, which makes it freaking harder to fail. Yes, because they failed and then they just like moved towns and started again. (laughs) And like just didn't pay their bills and then sent a check later. Yeah, and it never stuck stuck with them because what was a resume? You were whoever you said your name was. But then the flip side of it is like, okay, it could be easier now because the internet internet provides you with a freaking free education and you can take Harvard courses online for free. Like not all of them, obviously, but there's just so much out there. There's so much information. There's master classes. Mm -hmm. There's just so much more accessible information, even with, if you think about like libraries, anyone can walk into a library and get on the computer and yeah. like, you don't have to have a phone. You don't have to have a computer. You don't have to have internet access. You can be homeless and taking Harvard courses. Oh my gosh. Which is crazy and mind boggling, but also there and are that's, so that, many that's more. America right there. Like that is America. That that's is America. the spirit and the like lifeblood of 
opportunity and every man is free and equal, but we know that's not always true. Yeah. In actuality, so, how is that in real life? How does that play out? Yeah. But that doesn't, I feel like that still doesn't mean like the American dream is that the odds are stacked against you. And that is fact. And mm-hmm. it is a struggle. It is harder for you. You mm-hmm. don't have that extra privilege and those extra resources, but it's still possible. Right. And I think that that part is true. Is it harder now than it was back then? I don't know. But I definitely do think that the American- It's still yeah, there for possible. the taking. Mm-hmm. It's still possible. You're right. There- that That is that is the the whole thing with the American dream is, is not that it's easy, but that it is possible. Yeah, because people in other countries, you can't, you're not allowed to marry outside of your caste or outside of your town even. There are just a lot less rules here. Yeah. <laughs> and, we're, and we are historically very okay with taking risks and- Americans are entrepreneurs. And we'll trust a little scrappy dude who just comes up and says he has a good idea. Yeah, let's take chances. Let's take risks. Let's change the world because we're Americans and we believe we can. Mm -hmm. We talk about how quickly generation-wise they went from absolute destitute and poverty, living in the ghetto, an immigrant in America, to the freaking number one spot in America, aka presidency. We talk about that and we geek out about that a little Not bit. Not even in the America. Actual, the world, right. Especially during that time. Was there anyone more famous than JFK? No. And so even, like- Even now, like years, oh, like yeah. decades after- He's been dead death, for 60 something years. He's definitely one of the most famous presidents. And his grandpa was born in the Irish ghetto. The American dream. That is the epitome of the American dream. They are. The American dream. Yeah, wow. Um, our Ringling Brothers episode is kind of back in this same era, and they very much were also the American dream coming from a one-room shack with no indoor plumbing to the circus kings of the world and some of the wealthiest men alive. Now that you say that, so were the Disneys. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they came from a very I mean, very they weren't lower as imp- impoverished. No, but they, they weren't like absolute destitute. But, but they, they were, were lower poor. class. I mean, yes. at nine years old, they were working from sun up till sundown. Yeah, and his dad had to keep starting new jobs and trying like different things. They had to because, move around a lot as yeah. kids because, yeah, their dad needed funds. And they built their company through the Great Depression. That's insane. Yeah. So we talk about that. We geek out about that in the main episode, how quickly they went from poverty to presidency. But I also am just thinking about, you know, what was happening in Joe's life while he's trying to, because he made that goal, Cassie said in the main episode, to make a million dollars by 35. I think it was 35, but it was, it was 1 million. Okay. And he actually ended up making two. Okay. So he had this goal. I'm going to Make be a my millionaire. first million by 35. It's easy to be like, oh, oh yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. He made his first million by 35, for sure. No. All the while, having a child a year, basically. <laughs> yeah. And his wife is not working. And they're so young. I think Rose was 24 when they got mm-hmm. married. He did go to Harvard, so he does have that. And Education he- as well as network. Yes, and he's white, so he has some privilege there. And he- grew up in a household where hard work is rewarded. So he's got like this work ethic. He's and he's been also, a weirdo his whole life. So mm-hmm. he's used to doing things that not everyone Weird. else is doing. Yeah. yeah. And like people judging him. But also he saw his dad like jump casts. And so he had a little bit of an evidence or an example of what's possible. Right up close to him. Yes. Where he could believe like, okay, I can change the stars. I don't have to stay in this generational. hmm he had the ability and the power to change things. He not only saw his dad jump casts, he saw his grandpa and then his dad jump cast. So they were trending. Their trend was a cast uh, generation. Mm-hmm. So he was like, hey, I, this is, I'm up next. I'm up to bat. Yeah, he like- My just, turn. That he, It gave him the permission to not question it, to just go and do it. Right. So that exists for him. But I do think that that is like huge. Insanely and I didn't think weird. about how, yeah, he started off his marriage with all of this debt, with- his wife's family not wanting him and thinking that he was a step down for their family. So he has like all of this emotional stuff going on. Plus kids are freaking a lot of money Uh and they end up having nine children. But wait, those kids, especially whenever he was still not very freaking rich and trying to make it, 
those kids had some freaking major health issues. They were not just like normal little kids. Yeah. JFK was sick all the time and Rosemary had intellectual disabilities that they didn't ha- know how to handle whatsoever. And JFK almost died like three, four times. Like he was hospitalized a lot as a kid. But then, yeah, you take into consideration the stress of dealing with all of that. It would be super discouraging for me. I would be like, what am I doing? Why am I trying to be rich? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because all of those like real life things are just so up close and in your face. And feel so all consuming and overwhelming at the time. I do think that that leads me into something that I've discovered as I've been reading more and more and more about them. I think that they both, Rose and Joe, had this innate sense of responsibility, a sense that they needed to contribute to society, to America, to the world. They didn't just want to just like make a a bunch of money and hoard it. They really did have this like outside perspective of of their family. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And, and they, their number one goal wasn't to protect their children. And you can see that in how they raised their kids. Mm -hmm. Their number one goal was to make impact the world through through their their children. Yeah. And teach their kids that, Hey, life's not about you. Life is about doing as much as you possibly can, whether you risk your life or not. It's Mm -hmm. not about safety. It's not about comfort. It's about going out and changing the world and using your life for good. Doing things and looking good simultaneously. Yeah. I think their religion had a lot to do with it. They mm-hmm. were super religious. In their minds, it wasn't about it was earthly a, things. It was a bigger picture. A wider grander picture, scale. exactly. It was a bigger picture. This is the beginning of a theme in the Kennedy family that I did not have an appreciation for before watching some of these documentaries yep. and some of the research that Cassie and I have done over their family. But they were amazing with giving back, public servantry. Yeah, like knowing where they stood and knowing their privilege and wanting to open that up to everyone, whether you were a different race, a different class, a different culture, a different faith. It was really cool how just like open arms they were. Because I always look at them as like rich white kids. We only ever hear the bad about the Kennedys. So anyways, I think that's really cool and something to like keep your ears perked to. And it was definitely something that they – inherited and learned from their family because it was such a strong belief for their family i don't know if that comes from catholicism or if that comes from i think so the fact that they so closely in their like lineage were poor and living in a ghetto that they had so much more appreciation for where they were now and could understand how a person could have to live in a ghetto and they knew that valuable people lived on the bottom everybody has something to contribute Okay, we are back from eating a snack because I was literally about to pass out, but here we are again. (laughs) Cassie had a whirlwind of a morning. We were basically constructing the set at like 7 o'clock this morning after we had already worked out and woken up real early. I take about an hour to like fully wake up in the morning. I'm just trying not to trip over my own feet right when I wake up and then it's just a gradual becoming more alive. And this morning I jumped out of bed, went to work out and then built the set. And then afterwards, I am sitting here during the podcast talking and I'm just like an overwhelming, (laughs) like this feeling is bubbling up within within me that I'm not okay. (laughs) (laughs) Cassie does not do well on little sleep or with no food. food. Yeah. And I'm like survival of the fittest over here. But then he just like tells herself that she feels fine and goes on and I'm like no I don't feel fine and I need to be better I'm so uncomfortable I need to be comfortable and like feeling like you're about to pass out it's not for me I need to pick up my dad at the airport in like 45 minutes yeah and I'm still super fatigued but hey we're freaking back and we're going on we could talk about the Kennedys forever literally Cassie and I will get done researching and editing the Kennedy script all day, all week for f- how many months now? <laughs> and still at like 9 p.m. We'll just be We're talking about the Kennedys and their relationship. Each other. Oh my gosh. Crying you- over something that yes. happened in the story. Watching more documentaries being like, what is happening? Our life has been wrecked by the Kennedys. <laughs> so I'm excited for you all to um, also get wrecked with us. Something that has kind of burst my bubble this past week talking about the Kennedys is realizing, oh my gosh, Joe and Rose must have actually really loved each other. Like I just, I don't know. I had such a cold freaking 
picture of the Kennedys and it's slowly, slowly being dismantled and like disintegrating. I think it's because of the the quote that you put in episode one about the her saying no more sex and mm-hmm. like her just being so cold to him. And how and they like had to have rules of like not bothering each other with family stuff. And it yeah, just seems tr- so- You travel and I'll take care of the kids and then I travel and you take care of the kids. It's It does seem so- regimented and cold and just like we are co-workers we are not mm-hmm. lovers and really they were in love for how many years before they got married and oh yeah that's crazy we didn't talk about that but they were together for like a decade before they got married yeah a long time and and, and all the while rose's father honey Fitz, was like do not marry or do not date this yes. dude he didn't want her dating him let alone marrying him. And basically all the way up to the altar was telling her this was not a good decision. Don't do it. I don't approve. And took her out of the country in order to separate them. I think with Rose's personality, she wasn't just like selling herself short or like settling for whatever or like, oh, I'm just in love and I'll forgo comfort or standards. She was not that personality at all. So no. like she must have seen something in Joe, though he had no money, though he put them in a bunch of debt and was not at the caliber or the standard that her family was at or that he wanted to be at. Or that she was at. Because or that she, she was, was all, at. She was also super educated, very well read, very traveled, and was the mayor's daughter. The mayor of Boston, not like the mayor of like Podunk City, right. whatever. So she had status. She had basically a career being the a socialite. Mayor's, yeah, being a socialite, exactly. And being kind of an academic, like was in the scene. Because of being on the scene, she must have met a lot of people, known a lot of important people, and she saw something in Joe, you know? Mm-hmm. Her dad took her out of the country for like, I think it was like two years or something like mm-hmm. that. It was a minute. And she still came back to him. So he impressed her in some yeah. aspect and area and maybe it was like a whole Jackie thing. But I, I don't think it was just that. Like um, a power couple arranged marriage for career or yeah. like what you wanted out of life. I don't think it was just that because I feel like they wouldn't have stayed together, first of all, for so long Especially before getting children. married. Their parents were saying don't. So it wasn't like this is good for you. Like this is good for your career. It wasn't that. I think too, so it's part of the coldness of Rose and how – strict she was Mm -hmm. but also partly because you hear all like a lot of what you hear about joe is that he's just constantly having affairs bringing his is that yours or mine yours okay (laughs) bethany's so out of tune with her body (laughs) that she doesn't know if that's her stomach growling or mine (laughs) basically and then also joe having all these affairs and basically treating her like garbage at times and dismissing her feelings And not being the best partner that he could be. But just none of it makes sense unless they love each other. He must have loved Rose. It only makes sense for him to love her. But then he freaking brings Gloria Swanson on a freaking private chartered plane to Hyannisport, to the family freaking home, and forces Rose to hang out with her on vacation, on the family vacation, like she doesn't know that- They're having an affair. That she's his mistress. And and she knows, and they know, and they all, Joe knows. And, he and just, all the kids know, which is the weirdest part to me because the kid, like, this is, this is bad. The kids are old. Like, yeah. they fully are aware of old what's en- happening. Old enough for Joe to- say to guests that come to the house, oh yeah, these are my daughter's friends and it's his freaking mistresses. Yeah. So his his, his daughters aren't five years old. To have them around your children your and to be telling your friends that they are your children's friends, that is like another level of- That's like a, a mental line that should not have been crossed. Because at that point, you're not just a horrible husband. Like you are compromising your children's understanding of marriage, of- Respect, What's appropriate? Yeah, respect. treating other people. How to even have just a relation, a healthy relationship. How to conduct yourself, how to view yourself. I just think that it'd be super confusing as a kid to see that going on. And I don't even know how, how you ever get a grip on what a healthy, respectful relationship is. Yeah. That's your frame of reference? Like, yeah. So then that makes JFK look like a little less bad. <laughs> Obviously, we all know about Marilyn and how she ties in with the Kennedys, but. I don't think that you know all the details of that. The full extent of it is bad. And it involves multiple siblings, 
girls and boys. And the CIA. And the CIA. (laughs) And Castro. Guys. It's bad. It's a deep, deep, deep hole. And it's all substantiated and like facts. Like I thought that the Maryland thing was a rumor. Just wait. It's bad. But it makes more sense when you have the context of this was their father mm-hmm. and this is how they were raised and it was sort of normalized in in an unusual way but it makes a lot of the upcoming pieces and the upcoming episodes make more sense so just keep that in mind in the future their father an insane cheater <laughs> but still loved his wife it's just it's it's very 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 irritating and mind-boggling and frustrating but that's just being human If you have listened to the movie episodes, going back and thinking through that, it makes a lot more sense why it seemed like JFK was such, because we obviously did those episodes before we ever researched really the Kennedys. Right. We were very much looking at it from Jackie's perspective. But it makes a lot more sense of why Jack really was in love with Jackie, had a fairly solid marriage, Mm -hmm. was a family man and a really good dad. Appreciated her and his kids. And felt like he was doing the right thing and he was a really, he felt like he was a really good husband and did not see. We have several quotes from him of Lee asking him something and he's like, what's the problem? Like, I'm not mistreating Jackie at all. I've made every freaking provision I could for her. I've provided her with everything she could want. And they were teammates behind the scenes at the White House. He included her in a lot. And so having that context, it's like, oh, he literally didn't really realize. And we mentioned it back then. We were like, the only thing that makes sense is that he's literally brainwashed. Yes, because he he thought he was like the best husband and yet still and it's like cheating on Jackie. And what? Like how this doesn't match up. But when you grow up in a bubble. Yeah. When you grow up in a bubble and that is so normalized and all your friends are doing the same thing, you you just feel like, oh, this is what men do. This is how men are. Yeah. It's- and it's fine. But it's still confusing to me. I mean, even knowing all of that, I'm still confused by it because it just right. doesn't make sense to mm-hmm. me. And the fact that Joe knew it was bad, obviously, because he was trying to hide it to an extent and also kind of gaslighting Rose by making it impossible for her to prove that he was cheating on her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which- I think he viewed as a gift or like a kindness, but it was totally not. It's just torture. But I was going to say, I think that Joe had a lot more awareness of what he was actually doing, it feels like and seems like, than JFK did. So Rose and Joe, to me, are just very confusing people and their relationship is the most confusing, even more than JFK and Jackie. More than anyone we've really talked about, any parents, because Black Jack and Janet the Bouvier sisters' parents. The issue was clear. Yes. It was a very toxic relationship. Yeah. Theirs, it's like they are so loyal to each other and they are such good teammates, yet- And they loved each other. And they loved each other and they had the same goals and aspirations in life, yet they still like borderline hated each other and were also so awful to each other Mm -hmm. in certain areas. But something that Rose did that kind of sat with me was when she tells her kids and like just basically complains to them about their father and creates this like laundry list of like things that are so awful that her husband is doing to her. It's almost like they're doing co-parenting, but they're not. It's like they're a a divorced, scheduled family, but then they're not. And a little callback to the Kardashian sibling episodes. Cassie and I have since started watching because in the beginning of that, we say we were not fans of the Kardashians prior to doing research. But they won us over then, just a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> since then, we have continued our research and been watching their new Hulu show, The Kardashians. And in it, Kim has a little moment with Chris talking about um, her divorcing Kanye, but how she still is never going to talk badly about Kanye in front of her kids. And that is one thing that Chris and Robert, the Kardashian siblings' parents, taught them and that they really appreciated growing up that no matter how mad at each other they were or how how bad it got, they never spoke about it in front of the kids. Yeah, so I just feel like as a kid, that would be so confusing where my dad is having these affairs, but bringing his mistresses over to the house and we have to be in the same area as them. But then my mom is complaining to me about my dad, but my dad's also the one who's like championing me and supporting me and wants me to to dive into like all of my interests with me. And my mom is the one who's making me do all these chores. So with the confusing dynamic between Rose and Joe, I 
I don't know why this is bothering me, but I'm like sitting there editing episode one and thinking about their relationship and thinking, because I'm seeing their wedding photos. If you are a top tier patron, then you have seen all of the interactive videos. I'm sitting there researching these photos, finding all of the like most intimate Kennedy family photos there are. And there are these photos of Joe and Rose on their wedding day and they're super young. And I was like, how how were they so cold and like didn't seem like they were in love when they started dating when they were like children? They had to have like had that like flirty honeymoon, like fun stage because first of all, they're kids and they could have been like flirting with anyone. Second of all, her dad didn't want her her dating him. And the fact that she was like willing to rebel against him to be with this dude, like she had to have really loved him and had those like in love feelings. It wasn't a, an arranged marriage. It wasn't a marriage out of convenience. Like these kids fell in love and then they got married and then they had kids. So how did you get from that to this relationship that like basically they're not sleeping together. She's not happy in the marriage and he is sleeping with everyone but her. <laughs> yeah, he's sleeping with everyone but her and and telling all their friends about it, like trashing on her in public and she is not getting any of her needs met. So how do you get there? And I'm just trying to put myself in Rose's shoes and see how that would happen and how I can go from a kid totally in love with this dude to that mm. cold relationship. It's that thing that we freaking talked about earlier and we talk about this all the time it's missed expectations I think that Bethany brought this up to me I didn't think (laughs) Bethany (laughs) thought she was like okay the switch kind of happened when they were married and I was like oh okay that makes sense because they that as soon as they got together pretty much they started becoming parents and whatever but she's like no they were together for so long before so I think when they got married and had a child, Rose's expectations of the who relationship she, and the dynamic and who she thought she needed to be to be a good mom. It's like her idea. Were, it like switched. Yeah. So she, and I'm, I recognize this or I'm like speculating about this because this kind of happened to me of like, you have in your, in your childhood brain, what a child is supposed to be. And then what a good adult is supposed to be, or what a good mom is supposed to be like. And it's like all these unsaid rules that you really weren't taught, but they were just like modeled for you. Mm -hmm. And, and with Rose, she went to an all girls Catholic school. So it was probably like really taught to her. Yes. And it wasn't just modeling. It was like, this is what a good woman does. This is what a good wife does. This is what a good mom does. And so in her mind, as a kid, she was allowed to like have fun and be in love and go on dates and be rebellious and be flirty and have fun with that relationship with Joe. But then when she got married and started having kids. I think it was mostly when she started having kids. Yes. She was like, oh, I can't have fun anymore. I can't be flirty and spontaneous and rebellious anymore because I have a duty to my child and I have a duty to my husband. And this is what a responsible mother is like uh-huh. a responsible mother does not go on all of these like frolicking dates and mm-hmm. I almost think she was like a one wing nine because you are a one and our mom is a nine and you guys both struggle with this of like feeling guilty for having fun feeling guilty for spending any money on frivolous things and like everything ones are like motivated by being righteous not like holier than thou and not like I'm right in the argument but like Morally. morally good. Yeah. Like, like you want to, you, your deepest desire is to be kind of like holy. Everything is so, I think, just feels so big of a deal. Yeah. And, and so like it's like all your question. little, yes, all of your little decisions make up who you are. And in the grand scheme of things, you, you are just want to be a world. good person. And yeah. It's just, it's way too existential. It's a very heavy weight. And I think that she, because like you've mentioned before also that ones in their like healthy state can go into a seven, which is a very fun person and they just want to have fun. But it's like maybe she was just a very, very much in that unhealthy expectation, Perfection, perfectionism. Critical one. Yes. Yeah. And um, so that all that fun kind of went out the window and she felt like Joe kept trying to get her to like kind of sin or like be bad. Mm-hmm. And so she just kept resisting him more and more and more because he was attached to her like temptations, mm-hmm. quote unquote, to like be frivolous and fun and have sex for recreation. Like she only wanted to have sex when it was like holy, which would be having to a child, create yeah. a, a human. And so I think that her expectations flipped, but then he didn't have a different set of expectations 
he was just a weird mm-hmm. entrepreneurial person from the beginning. Yeah. And so he didn't really change, but maybe more so she changed. And, and then flipped on. And then so once that flipped, he was like, what in the crisis is what happened? I That's not where, who I married. And then it and then she dug in harder and he dug in harder. Yeah. She was like, OK, then no sex at all. Mm-hmm. And he was like, OK, then watch me have sex with other people because I didn't sign uh, up. Yeah, it just it's makes just me so, throw up. so sad. And again, yeah, missed expectations. And he even basically said it in the quote yeah. that Cassie said in episode one. Oh, I hate that quote. But he was trying to tell her, like, that's not what God has called of you. That's not in the Bible. Yeah, that's he just literally something says that you that's, picked up from the nuns. <laughs> like, you're you, not a nun. You don't have to be, yeah, so prude. But he <laughs> he basically- with Prude with, with sex, but also just with, like, freaking life like she didn't even like want to have fun anymore yeah yeah. she was like everything has to be so heavy and anyways it sounded also like he was very loud and outgoing and probably super aggressive in his confrontation and she was very very passive so maybe they're just communication styles were like off I think that that tidbit just helps me understand their marriage a little bit better and understand and see how Rose it's like, could get to that point. Yeah. And it's like they were both trying so hard. They both cared so much. Her focus switched from being Joe's girlfriend or wife or whatever, or best friend to I'm a mom and my like the right thing to do, quote unquote, is to be the best mom that I can be. And so she was trying really hard and she was like had pure intentions. But yeah, she and she gave it. It might have been a little misplaced, and and maybe a lot of it was just that she was led astray with all of the like strict rules as mm-hmm. a kid. But yeah, mm-hmm. that kind of just like blew my mind that they were together for so long and had like a whole freaking relationship before they became parents. So they had to have freaking loved each other. They just had to have had fun together. And maybe that's how their marriage lasted because they had that foundation to go back to and they did have years of loving each other before all of the crap started and before they started having kids. And this is where we, as researchers, as observers of the story, take away some dang life lessons. Mm -hmm. First of all, that appearances are not everything. And it's crazy and kind of really cool that the Kennedys are the people that that are teaching me that because they did love to have a good appearance and their appearance was very important to them. But it shows me that though I, just a generation later, had the completely wrong appearance perception or an idea of the Kennedys, it doesn't freaking matter what I thought because they freaking changed the world and they did a heck of a lot of good. Mm. It does not matter what I thought. If random Joes want to come at you and misunderstand you and misrepresent you, try to cancel you, you can't always control that. And, And though the Kennedys tried to control it, they couldn't control it and they had to make their own peace with it as well. And we'll see that in the end of the story. That's a huge lesson. Decide what you care about and the rest doesn't matter. And we can't care about everything. And I wish I had the time and the energy and the money to care about everything and to be able to help with everything. The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F by Mark Manson is so good and it's a really short read. Basically the gist of like you don't have enough time, resources, cares, energy, power to do something about everything and you can't physically care about everything. And if you try to, you won't make an impact. So decide what you care about and use your entire life and your money, the power that you do have to be impactful in those areas. It's so freeing to not have to care about that type of stuff and to just be like, oh, all I'm responsible for is just doing good and making the right decisions and being a good person and contributing what I can and doing what I can. I don't need to worry about what it looks like or what other people think about it. It's just so freeing. So I think that that is a really good life lesson to take away from the Kennedys, that they really did care what God thought and they cared what each other thought to some extent. I mean, they're still human, but they did keep the end in mind, I think, yeah. in most um, you of can their see big that decisions. in their actions and, and mm-hmm. in the way that their lives panned out. You don't do those big things without perspective. And in future episodes, we're going to talk about what all they did. What all they did and do the ends justify the means And how selfishly selfless they were because it is so weird that the two extremes can appear the same a lot of times. What I came into it thinking were selfish moves ended up behind the scenes being the most selfless thing that they could do. I don't know how to say that. Like basically 
the two extremes are on like a sphere and they're literally right next to each other. Mm -hmm. The reason that we tell these stories is because it's, it's nice to like tell a lesson and like say a very anecdotal like piece of life advice, but it's, it's not very easily absorbed into our human brains like that when it plays out over someone's story of their life and like what happened to them and for them and what they did, it just like helps you absorb it. It becomes real. Exactly. I think that's super encouraging for us again, as listeners, as observers of this story that we can control the path in which our families go down to some extent, obviously, but to, to take on that, the end in mind. Yes. It's a mantra. larger perspective. Yeah. Not, not just your life, but how you can affect the generations to come and how they can affect everyone. Yes. And how we don't always know the impact that we're making as we're making it. So to just persist and to keep going and to do what you believe is right, whether you get to see the ramifications or not, if you really care about the world and people and future generations, then it really doesn't matter if you get to see that and you get that satisfaction or not. It's nice when that happens. But if you are moving in a positive direction for your children, for your grandchildren and for the future. Mm -hmm. Breaking cycles, starting new legacies. And you take on that power and that responsibility, like we keep saying about the Kennedys, then you will be impactful. You can, yeah, you can have a freaking impact for centuries. Change the course of history. Join us here next week to hear all about Jack's near-death experience and the mania that followed. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind-the-scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support, and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business.